My name is Amit Sajdeva and uh, welcome to NRC being conducted by uh, Shriram College of Commerce. Uh, the topic for today's discussion is, uh, uh, you know, new pedagogies in economics, uh, new teaching pedagogies in economics. And I will be bringing to you a perspective which is totally different and which you will not find in the, any textbook. It is my own uh, understanding that uh, if you are able to make your classes interesting, make them fun and you can uh, ensure that there is long term memory dents that are created in the mind of the uh, students, then they will be able to retain that information for a very, very long time you know, rather than being fleeting memory. So the technique that I will be discussing with you is called uh, anamorphosis, A-N-A-M-O-R-P-H-O-S-I-S. -S. I have written it down, I will show it to you in one of my slides. And uh, I'll demonstrate uh, this uh, methodology with a live example, which is based on research work that has been undertaken. And uh, anamorphosis is when you take, when you look at uh, anything that is in chaos, you look at anything that is uh, primarily totally disoriented. At the first look, it will look very, very disoriented. But from a very distinct perspective, from a very distinct uh, viewpoint, you will be able to look at and you will be able to connect the dots and you will find some clear image emerging. So anamorphous is, uh, you know, uh, bringing sense to chaos. So and then uh, how will I apply to a subject matter? Uh, we need to understand that when we are teaching then uh, what are we trying to deliver? What are the kind of outcomes that we are trying to achieve? I believe that there are four broad outcomes that need to be achieved in for any subject matter, whether it is economics, commerce, management, uh, when we're talking about social sciences. Uh, these four perspectives are primarily uh, number one, uh, knowledge, number two, skills, number three, a value orientation, and number four, knowledge, uh, an attitude, a positive and constructive attitude. And uh, we, need to, we need to use our uh, entire subject matter coupled with uh, live examples, case studies, uh, analogies, storytelling to make them achieve these four outcomes that there is development of skills. Skills can be communication, team skills, leadership skills, uh, analytical, reasoning skills, uh, you know, mathematical uh, knowledge. Uh, what we are looking at today is that uh, at the click of a button, students have access to Google and uh, through Google, they have access to information. Now, Google does provide you with information, but somewhere along the line as a course instructor or as, as an educator, it is very important that we use this information to make them understand. So we need to communicate understanding in our class. That is very important. Uh, in order to do so, we need to go two steps ahead of Google in terms of uh, bringing to them a, a perspective which nobody else has. Uh, let, me, let me demonstrate this to you with a live example. Uh, for example, let, let's look at uh, porters at New Delhi Railway Station. If you're looking at porters, I mean coolies. So if you go to New Delhi Railway Station, New Delhi Railway Station has 16 platforms. Now, these 16 platforms are, are uh, open to public from two sides. That means uh, a porter can move from uh, the car park to the, uh, to the platform, right, from one side and uh, cross uh, 18 platforms, eight, eight platforms, eight plus eight is 16. Now, the important part is that uh, when I was doing the study, uh, using basic principles of uh, scientific management, you could identify how much time that a porter takes to travel from uh, the car park to uh, the platform. Now, why this study, please? First of all, why, why did I look at this study? A normal perspective or a normal perception would be that a porter is earning about 15,000 rupees or 20,000 rupees uh, per month. But uh, the reality of the market is uh, very, very different. When I look at, when I studied this market, uh, you, you, it's a factor market. Uh, when, you, when I studied this market, uh, it, it gave me a lot of uh, knowledge and understanding and which I then applied to economics to understand certain phenomena. I was trying to look at uh, 
rural urban migration i was trying to understand competition in the factor market i was trying to understand uh, you know are there any cartels existing there or is there any form of collusion so my objective was to connect the dots my objective was to bring sense to chaos so coming back my study showed that it takes 8 minutes for uh, a porter to move from the car park to uh, to the platform and from the platform back to the car park uh, carrying the luggage that he is supposed to carry now on an average a porter will be hired when you are looking at uh, you you carrying more than two bags or three bags and most probably you are with the family and you you are at the railway station so what happens is that a porter generally charges uh, 100 rupees per bag i'm looking at very conservative estimates you could look at num a, a price point of uh, 75 rupees per bag or 50 rupees per bag uh, you know but but today's market they are charging as of today they are charging 100 rupees per bag now on an average if it takes 8 minutes for him to travel from the car park to the platform and then that means he could do at least 6 rounds in 1 hour assuming that uh, he is uh, bringing in he is fully optimally utilized for that entire 60 minutes the answer is not he is not fully occupied for 60 minutes he is uh, occupied for a lesser amount of time so no, on an average he makes about four you know four visits in one hour up and down so four visits uh, mean uh, means that he is carrying at least two or three bags if he is carrying two or three bags he can per bag he is charging uh, 100 rupees so on, on an average he is earning between 200 to 300 rupees for one movement from the car park to the platform that means it could be from 200 to 300 so let's take a conservative estimate that he is charging 200 rupees now if he is charging 200 rupees then uh, and he is making four visits in a day then what are we looking at four four visits he is four times he is traveling at 200 rupees and he travels for uh, 10 hours in a day he is working for 10 hours in a day then he is probably earning uh, 8000 rupees in a day 8000 rupees in a day if i work for 30 30 days then i am earning my salary is 2 lakh 40000 rupees a month on the other side again if i look at a conservative estimate these are very conservative estimates if i look at four times in a day uh, four times in an hour for 10 hours into 150 rupees that he is uh, earning for per every time he moves then he is earning about 6000 rupees per day now 6000 multiplied by 30 is uh, 1 lakh 80000 rupees now what am i trying to show i'm i'm trying to show a very strong now this is per month please this is uh, this is per month this figure is a per month figure okay he is earning this per month now if he is generating this kind of a salary then uh, uh, what are the implications of what is happening in this particular factor market uh this this particular model tries to explain uh, why is uh, there uh, rural urban migration why why do people leave their uh, rural villages and come to cities and start working uh the answer is very simple uh one they get very uh, gainful employment if they are able to generate employment if they are able to get jobs and uh if they want to get jobs then uh, they are looking for lucrative jobs that uh, they are uh, looking for jobs where uh, they are able to earn uh, quite a bit of money now if i multiply this uh, number by uh, by 10 or 12 if he is working for 10 or 12 months then he is actually ending up earning about 25 lakhs between 20 lakhs to 25 lakhs per per annum easily so why do they do it they they do it because of monetary gain they will sell off their entire land they will sell off their entire uh, uh, livestock they'll sell off their house and they'll migrate to the city they'll earn this kind of money for uh, a couple of years and uh, once they have a substantial amount there will be a reverse migration that will take place because they are rooted to their uh, land they are uh, rooted to agriculture they are rooted to their uh, uh, you know where they were born so they want to go back also so there is reverse migration and they have earned substantial amount of money so that uh, they could uh, go back and restart uh, with substantial amount of money in their pocket and start uh, you know their uh, buy land uh, start farming uh, build an agriculture stock and go on 
the second thing that I noticed about uh, this particular factor market was that uh, uh, there is an element of competition. There is a huge amount of competition. So why does everybody not go go and become a porter at uh, New Delhi Railway Station? The answer is that uh, if you want to become a porter at New Delhi Railway Station, you need to apply for it. You need to fill in a form. And that form would uh, cost you some very nominal amount of money and you fill in the form. And uh, they'll tell you that, okay, okay, you can become a porter, but uh, in order to become a porter, you'll have, there is a waiting queue of about uh, 15 years. 15 to 20 years is the waiting queue. So what is the alternative? So because the number of, uh, the number of uh, uh, porters on uh, on the New Delhi railway station is defined. It is uh, they cannot be more than a defined number of porters that uh, that the railway station allows. So this is a, a very very uh, uh, you know a, a closed market in a way. If somebody wants to become a porter, then there is a possibility that you could get uh, become a porter and get the license to do the baggage uh, carrying officially. Uh, through somebody else transferring his license or his uh, porter badge to you. Now, even that porter badge comes at a premium. You can well imagine what the premium on that porter badge would be if somebody uh, gets the porter badge transferred from an existing coolie to uh, a new incumbent. The second uh, aspect that I notice in this market is uh, something called the HAD, H-A-D-H. HAD is limit. So, when a train arrives at the platform, the number of porters entering a particular coach is limited. That is to say, if there are uh, 12 coaches in a train, then, the, then at every coach, there would be a defined number of porters that will enter the coach uh, to, uh, you, know, uh, you know, get baggage, etc. That means uh, two or three porters would enter a coach, not more than that. So they have a defined limit. It is an it is a invisible limit that is there. But it has been pre-decided by the porters that uh, nobody will infringe upon anybody else's territory. So it's a territorial collusion, a territorial demarcation of, uh, you know, job profile. So if too many porters enter a, a particular coach, there would be competition and the prices would come down. So if the number of porters that enter a coach is limited, then these uh, porters can bargain for a higher price. Uh, when we are looking at this particular factor market, I am. What am I trying to do? I am trying to uh, make sense of a lot of things. I am trying to uh, bring knowledge, understanding, and long-term dents in the mind of the viewer or the reader. That look, this is how we need to explain uh, rural-urban migration. One, talking about rural-urban migration with the help of statistics, numbers, makes sense. That, that is fine. But when it comes to me to uh, make a dent in the mind or a long term dent in the mind of my target audience, my, my students, then for me, I need to bring in a perspective which uh, uh, nobody else would have. Uh, let, me, let me demonstrate this uh, with the help of uh, a, a very simple example. Let me give you another simple example. But now I'll uh, take you to a, a, a a simple, uh, you may have a glass of water right in front of you and you would have poured water into it. And uh, if I ask you, what do you see? If you see a glass of water and uh, you know, you're pouring water into a glass, then what do you see? You will say, okay, the glass is half full, half empty. So somebody would say it's a pessimistic approach. Somebody would say it is a optimist approach. Somebody would say it's full. Why? Because it is a uh, half air and half water. So it is still full, full with two particular elements. I, when, when we talk about anamorphosis, I, I, I'm, bringing, I'm looking at the same glass of water, but I'm bringing in a very different perspective. Now, what is that perspective? If I look at that particular glass of water, I'm looking at, number one, adaptability. Uh, water is adaptable. It takes the shape of the container in which it is placed. Second, I'm looking at transparency. I'm looking at water being transparent. Water is transparent. I can see through it. Although there is a refraction involved, but there, yes, there is... Uh, possibility that it's transparent, you see through, I can see through it. Point number three, uh, water is essential for survival and growth. Fine. So I've talked about number one, I've talked about uh, adaptability, I've talked about transparency, I've talked about survival and growth. Water is essential for any living uh, organism uh, to need to survive, to have water to survive and grow. What else? I'm looking at water as soft. Is there anything softer than water? I'm still trying to figure out. 
is water powerful? Yes, water is powerful. Water is uh, the power of water is, uh, uh, you know, it, it can take the shape of a tsunami. And if it is in the shape of a tsunami, it can hit you very, very badly. So it is powerful. Then uh, is water transformative? Yes, water is transformative. Why? Because water can change its form and become a gas and water is capable of becoming uh, not just uh, gas, it can also solidify. Now, if I start bringing in all these features, which I'm looking at a simple glass of water, what do I come down to? I can look at the entire theory of any leader through this glass of water. That is to say, a leader needs to be, number one, he has to be adaptable. Number two, he has to be flexible. Number three, he has to be transparent, part of corporate governance. A leader has to be soft. Certain situations demand that a leader has to be, uh, have a very soft approach to his management. Uh, a leader has to uh, be powerful. He has to take very strong decisions. Uh, a leader has to ensure survival and growth of his uh, organization. A leader has to be transformative. What have I done? In this entire exercise, I have taken a simple glass of water and explained an entire theory of leadership to you in a very, very simple dented manner where I dent you for long term. And this is what anamorphosis is. Anamorphosis is looking at something with an entirely new perspective, looking at something which nobody else looks at. And when you bring in this unique and distinct perspective to your teaching, which makes, you know, plausible sense, on the face of it, it makes a lot of plausible sense, then you are able to make uh, teaching very fun. You are able to ensure that students are able to grasp the topic. You are able, in addition to the content matter, I'm already saying that content is important. Content, you know, talking about content, talking about features is very important. But how do you bring that across? That, that is a, a very important uh, uh, job of a teacher to achieve. Now, if a teacher is able to achieve this through various methodologies, you could use storytelling, you could use case studies, you could use uh, mythology, you could use sports, you could use history, you could use geography, you could use uh, any multidisciplinary technique and, and bring in that perspective which uh, is unique, distinct and makes a lot of sense then I think as, as an educationist, you have been able to achieve your objective. And uh, I could go on, but uh, I have a limitation of time, so I'll wind up here. Thank you so much for listening in. If you have any further queries, you can uh, email me and I'll be most happy to respond to your queries, please. I would uh, finally, uh, you know, make a comment where I'll say that uh, Anamorphosis is only one of the techniques that uh, you could innovate and uh, become, become creative in your uh, delivery content and delivery of your lectures. Uh, but uh, what is extremely important is to remember that all these innovative techniques should uh, be based on achieving certain defined outcomes which I discussed earlier. And I'll uh, recap, as I said, I'll show you to you these outcomes on a slide. So if you look at this particular slide, you will find that uh, what we are trying to achieve is, uh, number one, we are trying to achieve skills, we are trying to achieve knowledge, uh, skills, knowledge, values and attitude. And uh, you have to remember that uh, all these four can be achieved through uh, teaching of any subject matter. You could use economics, finance, marketing, HR, accounts to achieve these desired outcomes because at the end of the day, we are trying to make our student uh, employable, we are trying to make our student you know, uh, develop, at the end of the day, develop character. Uh, character is uh, extremely important that they say that, you know, if uh, wealth is lost, nothing is lost. If health is lost, something is lost. But if character is lost, everything is lost. So uh, I, I would conclude that every lecture that you uh, undertake, uh, every lecture should be treated as, uh, uh, you know, a moment of truth, uh, a moment of reckoning. Because uh, that one hour is not, uh, just one hour, it is uh, 50 uh, students sitting in your class and those are equivalent to 50 uh, man hours. So don't underestimate the power of your lecture. Your lecture is equivalent to uh, 50 man hours, please. Be, you are uh, building assets uh, for this country, future assets of this country. And it should be your goal that every lecture, uh, you know, you are able to achieve uh, your desired outcomes. So please, uh, the important part is prepare well. Uh, preparation is the key. 
and uh, what is important is uh, quality will come from detailing quality uh, will come from uh, you know uh, the more detail uh, in depth knowledge that you build up and you deliver in your lectures uh, thank you so much thank you so much